Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Halcyon. It's been a while since I filmed one of these, so I thought I'd kick off with something that's very near and dear to my heart. On this episode, I'm going to be reviewing a game that came out back in 2003 and came out of absolutely nowhere. LucasArts came up with Knights of the Old Republic and it stunned a lot of people because it relied on something that's been overlooked in recent years. It didn't rely on flashy graphics or even a good game engine for its, uh, for its mass appeal and didn't even go so far as to mooch off of the license of its previously established stars and lore. Knights of the Old Republic was designed as a game for the hardcore fans to immerse themselves in the world in a more thematic and realistic way than ever before. Focusing less on a certain extent to combat, albeit combat is in this game, and of course less on space battles, again they're in the game and I kind of wish that they weren't, but more importantly, they focused on your story and your progression towards your own mastery of your own destiny. It allowed you to do things like become a paragon of good, stand for truth, justice, and uphold the wise and ancient tenets of the Jedi Code. Or become an agent of evil, succumbing to the dark side, enforcing your will upon its weary and unsuspecting world. Both really cool ways of going about the game. The Sith bow before you. You have reclaimed your rightful throne. The Jedi Order is in tatters. It is only a matter of time until your Sith minions wipe them from the face of the galaxy. The Republic fleet is decimated. The core worlds are defenseless against us. And this concept isn't just limited to who you attack and who you side with. It's expanded upon in nearly every other facet of the game. How you design your character, how you interact with uh, NPCs and the world at large. And it really was one of the first times that a game allowed you, within the Star Wars mythos, to shape and craft a character and a narrative that really felt like it was your own within the Star Wars mythos. So, on this occasion, let's look at a game that's begging for a HD remake, just as much as I'm begging Nintendo to make a 3D holographic version of Pokemon Blue, Yellow, Red or Green. On this episode, we're going to be taking a look at Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. This is but a taste of the dark side. So let's start with its setting and premise, why I really gravitate towards the game as much as I did. The game takes the bold step of omitting pretty much everything from its established universe, characters, lore, ships, planets, with the exception of a few which are really cool to visit, and instead decides to establish itself 4,000 years prior to the events of the films, or indeed any other established lore prior or post that. It does, however, take the very clever and rightfully taken uh, stance of incorporating things that are familiar from the films in terms of its music and setting and characters, um, uh, in terms of the races, to make you feel like this world is somehow familiar, even if it isn't the world that we're used to. And perhaps most importantly, it decides to again completely omit and ignore the Skywalker storyline, instead focusing on a new conflict, new characters of pivotal and uh, increasing importance depending on who you encounter. The worlds that you visit, the galaxy at large, even the culture and the feel of the game has been crafted in such a way that everything does feel fresh and new. It feels like you're exploring all of this for the, for the first time, but it retains a really great sense of authenticity, like I mentioned in some of the music that's used, the musical cues, again not borrowing directly from the films, but using cues that again help make you feel immersed in the game. Some of the architecture that's used, it all feels authentic and it feels like it would be derivative or something that's derived in the Star Wars universe. 
And even things like weapons in the game, clothing and ships, they feel like they've been influenced, but not directly copied or borrowed from the Star Wars films. With the plot itself focusing around the second great galactic conflict. Now, I am going to get into a bit of detail here, so for any Star Wars noobs, there is a f**k ton of lore in, in the Star Wars universe. Again, probably 10,000 years worth of lore if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it. And this happens to take place in the Second Great Galactic War between the Old Republic, the aforementioned Old Republic, and the newly risen Sith Empire led by an evil and enigmatic Dark Lord of the Sith by the name of Darth Malak. A powerful fallen Jedi who usurped the mantle of Dark Lord from his previous and somewhat mysterious Sith Master, Darth Revan. A Jedi who himself fell to the dark side of the Force, but is spoken with hushed terms as a prodigal knight who, through lack of a better phrase, fell to the dark side through pursuit of power. Malak was always portrayed as the one that followed him and ultimately usurped his opportunity to kill his old master and take the throne of Dark Lord for himself. Revan was a brilliant military leader and the Republic fleet began to win victory after victory. Four years ago, the Mandalorians surrendered unconditionally. The war itself has raged for between four and eight years, coming off the back of a previous conflict called the Mandalorian Wars, raged by the Mandalorians, Boba Fett's ancestors. <laughs> and this is the bit where I get a little bit back of the gamey. I'm going to read it directly so that I can really get the enunciation right, because I wrote this. Not at the back of the game, I really put some thought into this one. Are you ready? Here it comes. This turmoil has left the galaxy in a state of perpetual chaos, with the only constant being war. Loyalties are constantly shifting, and there are heroes on both sides. Three years ago, Revan and Malak returned at the head of a massive invasion fleet. Revan had assumed the title of Sith Lord. The hero had become a conqueror. For two years, the Sith were all but invincible. Fortunately, Bastila and her battle meditation allowed the Republic to win a few key victories and kept the Sith from total triumph. In desperation, we set a trap for the Dark Lord. Bastila was with the strike team that tried to capture Revan, as you probably know. She was there at Revan's end. And this is where you come into the game. You assume the role of a seemingly insignificant Republic soldier aboard a freighter that's carrying some very precious cargo. In fact, you've been tasked with protecting a young Jedi Knight by the name of Bastila Shan, who in of herself is a, isn't a particularly powerful Jedi. She's skillful, she's young, but she possesses a unique talent for something called battle meditation, a power that allows you to sway uh, sides in war. It um, has single-handedly kept the Republic in the fight against the seemingly insurmountable and invincible forces of the Sith up until this point. And it's rumored that her allegiance is critical to the Republic war effort. And she's been heralded as one of the last great hopes of the Jedi Order, let alone the Republic. The Jedi Order themselves have been decimated by Sith defections and assassinations to the point where the, the, the Republic and the Jedi both face extinction should they lose. So where do you fit into the scheme of things? Well, that part we'll cover in the story section. Suffice it to say though, the setting and the premise do an excellent job of immersing you in its world. You instantly feel like you're in the middle of something important with tons of gravity and so much going on and you're just thrust into it. There's a battle going on ab above and ahead. You just gah, deal with it. It's great. And in doing so, kind of takes your eye off a very critical element that if you pay, if, again, if you play again, there's a very critical element that you'll overlook in these first few moments that is really in interesting to look back on. It's kind of, if you've ever played uh, Bioshock, the original, you'll know what I'm talking about. But we shall get to that later on. I was sitting there thinking, I absolutely love this and I absolutely can't wait to see what this galaxy needs and to see if I'm the hero it deserves. Sorry, sorry, wrong beloved franchise. It has to be said though, Revan does kind of look like Batman in the cutscenes. In fact, I'm Revan. See, kind of 
it. And so we come on to the next section. Perhaps the most divisive aspect of this game's gameplay, if you will, it's combat. And let's get it out of the way first because I think it's the easiest thing to kind of dispel. Knights of the Old Republic utilizes a turn-based combat system within the realm of a free roaming style game. It allows you to combat opponents, multiple ones, using a variety of skills and abilities that you obtain throughout the course of the game. Standard attacks, abilities, force powers, uh, explosives and other means including health packs and so on and so forth. Along with the squad dynamic, you can have two members of your squad with you at any time and you recruit nine members in total. And these members can be directed to use their powers and abilities to aid you in combat. With the exception of some very critical story plot points where you must face your foes alone and usually these are crazy odds and you need to make sure you've prepared well in advance for them. And before combat even begins, you can equip members and yourself with up to 7 to 11 items or equipable items on your body, ranging from helmets to clothing to weapons uh, to more unique things like nerve implants and shields, blockable shields that will aid you in combat. And the damage is denoted by a rolling system, so it's uh, kind of like an old school RPG in the sense that it's a time system, so you start off relatively minor with things that can do 10 damage, by the end of the day you can do hundreds if not thousands worth of damage in a single hit. In terms of weaponry, and it does kind of get interesting here, you get standard swords, then you get vibro blades which are like swords, uh, then you have standard blasters, grenades, mines, and of course, lightsabers, sweet lightsabers, which you can press Y and whip out and they just kind of do this business. I used to do that all the time. No other reason than to kind of just go, he lightsaber, he. And he just stood there like this, doing nothing. Don't know why they let you do that, but I'm so happy that they did. I can't say, if, if you say that you never press that button just to whip out your lightsaber for two seconds and see him twirl it around, you're lying. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to me. And like I say, these can be used in tandem. Blasters don't tend to be used towards the end of the game with most people preferencing, uh, preferencing lightsabers. But they can be given to other less combatly minded squad members, including droids. But didn't I also mention that you have lightsabers? I don't think I mentioned that. That's a really important and crucial point. They have lightsabers and f***ing sweet. And with the lightsabers, again, this adds another layer to the RPG elements because you can craft them. You can improve not only the just the colour, which again is pretty sweet, but also the combat modifiers themselves, not only by your character, but by your weapon. You can add different crystals that you can accumulate while exploring the world into the lightsaber hill itself to alter its abilities, its attack probabilities, its attack strengths. It's brilliant. It really, again, helps add to the sense of immersion, training to become a Jedi. The path you have chosen to walk is difficult. Intensive training will prepare you physically for the demands of the Order. Meditation will teach you to channel the power of the Force. Or Sith. Because you can't really tell anyone you're training to be a Sith when you get a dance to train to be a Jedi, otherwise they wouldn't have trained you. So you have to kind of lie about it. It's pretty sweet. Talk about it later. These weapons combined with your combat techniques make you incredibly powerful in combat, but you will come up against enemies that are specialised against certain types of combat patterns, so you have to be tactical with the way that you come at things sometimes. And perhaps one of the, again, divisive, I like this element personally, other people's don't. The way that you level up throughout the game is that you attack and you do certain tasks to gain XP. Now the thing is that your members, your squad party members, accumulate these XP points as well. So even if you don't have a particular party member with you at all times, let's say, Unlike Pokemon, they all level up at the same time, so if you do end up wanting to use a squad member, let's say, to take on a particular type of quest that may be unique to them, they're not immediately at a disadvantage. You can take them, and it doesn't feel like you then have to spend ages slogging through training them up. Now, again, I can understand how this can feel cheap to some people, but I personally really, really enjoyed that fact. I was super surprised the first time I played it through to say, do you know what, I fancy playing with, you know, I uh, fancy getting Candorous in uh, my party. Badass Mandalorian dude, or I want to get HK47 in. There's a theme here, all the bad guys I want with me for some reason. Anyway, you bring them in and immediately they feel useful, they feel relevant, and that's a great touch to this game. 
And along with powers, you can use skills. And these usually uh, add to the type of character you want to be. So if you want to be a melee character, there are skills that enable you to become more proficient in melee combat and vice versa with blasters. You can be a non, but you can be a pacifist to a certain extent by specializing in skills that enable you to be better out of contact, uh, combat, such as persuasion techniques, hacking techniques, repair techniques, things of that nature. And even then, there are different types of attacks. So let's say for melee, for instance, you've got flurry, power, normal, and critical. They have different effects and they can specialize toward different enemies. So let's say for the sake of argument, you're facing a number of enemies at the same time. It's better to use flurry because let's say they're all low armor rated, it tends to work through them. The more powerful enemies on the other hand, it may be worth investing in a critical strike. Now this might not do as much damage, but does have an ability to stun them, allowing you to take another turn. And this turn-based combat is critical because you need to master it to make sure that you know, like Pokemon, I don't know why I keep making the comparison to that, it might just be because it's the best game ever, it's critical to not only know how good you are, but what your weaknesses of your opponent are, and you'll find yourself mastering this more and more as you go throughout the game. You can also use grenades and uh, mines to outflank and outmaneuver your enemies, especially the more powerful ones and the bigger ones. But to be honest, you will only again tend to use these in the beginning of the game when your skills are relatively low or you don't even have the skills yet to be able to take on the larger scores of enemies. When you progress and the more powerful you become, uh, there'll be times where you absolutely monster it and you feel like an unstoppable Jedi or Sith. Force push and force lightning are the two powers that I always wanted to master, even if I was good. However, don't be too proud of this technological terror of worth of goodies, explosives and armor that you've accrued. Because of course, there is the under, no, that's wrong, I'll stop trying to be epic. There's the unwavering and unfathomable power of the force to unleash upon your enemies. I'm just going to list them now. Force Lightning, Force Push, Force Wave, Whirlwind, Death Field, Force Choke, Force Speed, Force Valor. A choice of around 20 powers that you can uh, not only get, but improve in certain ways. So if you're a light-sided individual, you can, you can pick predominantly light side powers or neutral ones vice versa with dark side powers. There is a penalty for using powers that don't match your alignment. So for smart players, they might want to try and stay as neutral as possible throughout the course of the game, so not to be penalized for using one or the other, but without having the benefits of one another. Vice versa, if you want to be a paragon and be purely good, you will see massive benefits towards the force powers that you use, but massive penalties if you use dark side powers, hence why my good friend Michael Brennan is always evil. Better still, the armor sets are fully customizable, with, albeit it's kind of, you put clothes and it's everything. Uh, the only other thing you can really customize apart from clothes is your helmet, but again, you can customize your weaponry, what kind of armor that you want to wear. If you upgrade further, you can add different pieces, and it's serviceable. The armor sets that you, you get end up being quite critical, and they make you feel quite cool about yourself when you do get it. However, as much as I might gush about it, I do understand why people don't like it. It does have sometimes a very disconnected and disjointed feel. It can sometimes it can sometimes feel like you're left watching the fight instead of actually participating it. I can understand why some people don't like it. I personally don't. I think it adds to the cinematic feel of the game. It makes you feel like you're watching an epic encounter, especially since it's been choreographed so that the attacks all look individual. So again, if you you know you're bored and you don't want to you know you don't want to just sit there, well get him to do some interesting shit and watch him do it. It's freaking badass when you do it right. And like I was saying to you, sometimes I enjoy just setting the characters on to fight and watching the carnage and mayhem ensue, watching my enemies fall before me, watching my colleagues fall. They, oh, the AI isn't great, I'll get to that later. But it's great watching it unfold. And for that, I've got to give the game props. It's fun to watch sometimes. Combat aside though, the game is structured from the ground up to be uh, an RPG in every sense of the word. Lots of talking, lots of collecting, lots of quests, uh, lots of abilities to upgrade. 
And uh, more to the point, something that was elaborated further on in Mass Effect, and probably other games that I've not played, is the ability to have conversations with NPCs. Now, these conversations are dictated by the response, by the NPC, uh, and your conversation selection. You usually have at least two responses. Sometimes you are literally left with one, which makes me think why you'd even be given the selection in the first place. But more often than not, the conversation choices will lead you down different branching paths of light side, dark side, will open different branches of quests will close off quests if you don't have certain skill sets like a high persuade level might not enable you to be able to talk someone into doing something or out of something uh, you might need to use powers sometimes you can use the force persuade ah, these are not the drawers you're looking for you will give me a free beer you will deliver this KFC you know it just gives you the ability to be able to do that if you feel so but beware that may incur you dark side points if you're not careful. Again, if you're a dark side or anyway, you're probably going to mind control the fuck out of everybody, you absolute evil son of a bitch. <laughs> That aside though, the conversations do feel in depth, they do feel like, you know, they mean something, and they do help you guide the narrative of the story to a certain extent. Most will progress the story anyway, but there are genuine times where you can get locked off by things. The Selkath world of Manan, for instance, is an excellent example of this. Combat is almost rendered mute for a lot of it. So you have to use your persuasion and your keen sense of diplomacy to be able to get to the bottom of a lot of what's going on. To get to the full to, to get the full experience of that planet, you need to make sure that your persuasion technique is as good as it possibly can be. And better still, the conversations throughout the game will have lasting effects throughout the game. Friendships will be made and broken, relationships rekindled, um, citizens can be impressed or implicated by the actions that you do. And so if you enjoy the spirit of conversation, persuade and charisma are two things that you really want to invest time in when you're playing the game, and to a great extent you'll enjoy being part of the narrative, guiding it and seeing how it goes. And what's great is the lore in this game is so deep. Talking to people will allow you to learn things about the world that you never did, even if you're a massive Star Wars fan. Especially when you visit places like Korriban and the Jedi Temple. You learn so much about the lore. So much of my time in the first instance was just listening to people talk and telling me about all the great things that apparently I came too late to the game for. But it was still great to listen to. And even then, if you can't be asked with the conversation, you can just intimidate them. Threaten to kill them. I'm sure they'll tell you whatever you need to know in like that. Practically mandatory for a Sith to do. <laughs> The Force should not be used for profit and personal gain. As Jedi, we should be above such things. And even then, if you don't like conversation, there are, again, other ways of getting to your objectives. The hacking skills and repair skills, for instance, will allow you access to areas that might have been closed off to you otherwise. And what's great is that with the ability to do multiple playthroughs, they will allow you to experiment. You can play as one playstyle or one character type, and then go through it again and experience the game in a whole new way just by leveling up different aspects. It allowed me to go from being a kind of varied and wild character with peak, peaks and troughs in different areas that didn't really make me a particularly effective character to the second time where, oh my god, my melee was amazing. I don't think there was anything that could survive more than two hits of mine, even Malak at the end. Ooh, man, it was great, just bulldozing through everything. Once again, we shall face each other in single combat, and the victor will decide the fate of the galaxy. And again, outside of combat and conversations and exploration, you've got a couple of distractions. Other than distractions, swoop bike racing isn't great, but it's serviceable and it allows you to win a lot of money if you're really good. Uh, 
Pazark, I gotta be honest, I never understood Pazark at all. It's a card game that you you play and you collect cards and uh, I don't know, I guess that's how everyone was able to afford all the sweet, sweet loot that I couldn't buy. I had to get it all from Sweet Bar Races, but even that money went quick. This is the thing, a lot of the stuff in the game is preposterously high priced. I suspect again to encourage multiple playthroughs, but there was some stuff I just really wanted to buy for the fuck of it. It just looked sweet because it was expensive and I wanted it. And of course it's Star Wars! So there's space battles! Oh wait. No, seriously, they're really not great at all. Um, they're on rail shooters, usually when you're trying to escape from somewhere or uh, fly somewhere and they just kind of randomly generate and you're sort of sitting there doing this business and you go choo, 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 choo and they fly overhead. I, I never died from one of these. There's zero jeopardy, zero skill involved. You just shoot until they all go away and then you fly away and the sweet music does play and you fly away and it's pretty cool. But Space Battles itself, I would have expected something a bit deeper from Star Wars by now. I was one of the people that played the original X-Wing, uh, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, uh, oh god, Rebel Alliance, I forget the one, you start off in a B-Wing and you crash in Tatooine and you become the guy, I can't remember what the name of that was, but that's the one I played when I was a kid because the B-Wing would do this, it would split and do that, ah, oh, B-Wing for the win. Anyway, point being, the Space Battles, they do leave a little bit to be desired, it has to be said. But, overall, I'd say the game's mechanics do a really, really good job of making you feel immersed in its world. It gives you a taste of everything. Like I said, the combat can be divisive and the conversation is very, very lengthy. So if you're not into that kind of thing, get off board now because you're just going to be... It's about the story. It's about immersion in the world of Star Wars. And if you, that's what you're after, man, even today, 12, 15 years on, whatever it is, this game still does it better than anything else I've played in terms of the Star Wars universe. Its mechanics are just... Simple, but so functional. It creates a cinematic experience that's so well crafted, it's absolutely fantastic. And so we come to probably the weakest point of this game series. The graphics. It's impossible for me to be able to argue that even when this game was released, the graphics were anything that were considered to be good. Blocky, repetitive, sluggish, with very little weight or texture to anything you saw that wasn't a, a pre-rendered background. And it never really caught me. I mean, Tatooine specifically is a really, really bad one. The, the Mos Eisley itself is, is, is serviceable, but when you get out into the deserts, Man, is it bland! Really, really boring! The cutscenes are a mixture of pre-rendered CGI, which uh, can look flaky at best. Again, we were talking about 2003, but even then the graphics weren't great. And then it cuts to... Uh, using in-game models um, that talk, again very, have a very cardboard feel. You can forgive this when the game is you know, in free flow mode and you're kind of talking back and forth and it has to do it on the fly, but in cutscenes, I don't know, it looks a little bit lazy at times. It can, it doesn't break the immersion, but it certainly doesn't help it. Uh, most times in game, the graphics, you don't notice them a lot because you are caught up in the intensity of the moments. You're, you're paying attention to what's being said. In the cutscenes, it becomes a lot more noticeable. And I can't argue against the people that don't like the game for that, for that particular reason. But come on, it's just graphics. The Jedi do not believe in killing their prisoners. No one deserves execution, no matter what their crimes. 
The soundtrack, on the other hand, is absolutely excellent. The sound effects sound genuine. The ships, the lasers, the lightsabers, the sound effects, the story, um, uh, the story-based theme music that's that's unique to this game is is absolutely fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Recommend this game playing it just for the soundtrack alone. The way it allows you to explore is great. Uh, I think there's probably between, I want to say seven, eight, nine planets to explore, which doesn't sound like a lot, but each will probably take you a good two or three hours to explore fully. And sometimes you do just catch yourself just kind of wandering around. Manan, I would say, is probably the most impressive. It's like this big sea planet with a big city stuck right in the middle of it. And it's all kind of mazed off. It's not very point to point. You have to locate areas and maneuver to them quite, you know, diplomatically. It's not. It's 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 quite hard to maneuver. But that's a good thing. The exploration allows you to go into every nook and cranny and feel like there's something to find everywhere. But again, it has to be said that some of them don't feel like they have a tremendous amount of life to them. Again, Tatooine being one of them. There's so many things going on, but when you actually go up to them to try and interact with them, you can't. It's just a load of Tusken Raiders jumping out of everywhere going, <coughs> That wasn't a very good impression, but still, it's a Tusken Raider. It's not meant to be a very good impression. They do it the, they do it the best themselves. But speaking of voice acting, the casting in this game is absolutely brilliant. Bioware did an absolutely amazing job of casting the right people for the right roles, getting the uh, getting the uh, the characterizations well rounded, and well done. Each character feels unique, fleshed out, and purposeful. They don't feel like they're there as a token character. Each person has a set of beliefs and ideals that can conflict and cross with other people. And you often encounter this when you're walking. The, the characters that you bring with you will have discussions that don't involve you. They'll just have conversations between themselves, sometimes ending in arguments, other times ending in debates and epiphanies. It's really kind of interesting taking people along because then they'll interact with each other and you'll see what they're like as people. Hey, I ain't no kid. I look out for Zalbar as much as he looks out for me. Big C's my friend, not my babysitter. Geez, I come ask you a question, you give me a lecture. Don't you snap at me, Missy. You want a lecture? How's this? Only bratty little children fly off the handle because of a simple... You really mean it, don't you? Nobody's ever said anything like that to me before. Not even Big Z. He might think it, but he's not really one for words, you know. Thanks, Karth. Well, it's no big deal. I, mean, I know how it is. Sometimes you just need to hear a few words of encouragement. Kids are like that. Kids are like that? Listen, you... <laughs> oh, I get it. Okay, you got me. You're pretty funny, Karth, for an old guy. Come on, geezer. Let's get back to what we were doing. Uh, again, a, a kind of a knock. While your ca character is fully customizable, um... The cast, it, uh, less so. Although saying that, uh, vaguely to the same extent. The only thing is you can't customise them, of course, because they're characters. But uh, you've got Karth Anassi, who's a pilot. Bastard Shan, who's the aforementioned Jedi Knight and potential love interest. But I don't... I mean, I can't. I'm, Malak will... Who am I? Kanda Rosordo, who's uh, the Mandalorian, badass dude, he's awesome, he's kind of like Boba Fett if Boba Fett didn't have the helmet. Uh, you've got Jolie Bindo, who's the wise, pragmatic, it's kind of like a cross between Herbert the pervert, only without any of the perversion, and it, it just kind of like Shaq or Samuel L. Jackson. He's like Samuel L. Jackson who was super old and didn't swear, which sounds kind of boring, but trust me he isn't. Mission Veo, who serves as like the teenage, you know, naive, hopeful member of the team. Zalbar, who's the big old wookie dude, who isn't kind, he, he kind of is okay, he's no Chewbacca, but he's, he's kind of cool. T3M4, who serves as like the R2 unit with a dustbin for a head. I say that, but there's a book that I read and something happens and it wasn't great. Something happened to T3. Really loved him and something happened and I'm not sure he's going to be okay. Thanks, Brenny. And of course, last but not least, HK-47, a badass assassination droid who refers to people as meatbags and, you know, is basically the Terminator only kind of better built. Commentary. I say we blast the meatbag and save you the trouble, master. What's with all the droids lately? My wife get to you too? Negative. I just don't like organic meatbags. 
Except for the master, of course. Uh... But as I said, they have all their, they all have their own personalities, they all have their own ambitions, and they all have their own stories and quests to fulfill throughout the course of the game. If you talk to them and you earn their trust, different missions will become unlocked to them and will enable them to grow as individuals, further aligning themselves with you or further you know, furthering their own path. And some of the characters can even be killed at certain points of the game, meaning that they don't make it to the end, which is, again, a great dynamic plot point. Doesn't mean that everyone's gonna live. You. I, Zuhani, shall be your death. And what's great is, you can interact with any one of them at any time. It feels dynamic, it feels realistic. Like sometimes they don't want to talk to you. Now, of course, this is linked in with the mission progression mechanic, and once you realise it, it can feel a little bit disheartening to know that they're not going to talk to you until you do the next mission. But by the same token, it's still you don't have to talk to them if you don't want to. If you want to just crack on with your missions, sometimes someone will perk up and say, hey, you might want to go and talk to so and so. But you still don't have to if you don't want to, and that, it again allows a, a layer of realism, makes these characters feel unique, and you can approach the ones you like, ignore the ones you don't if that's really what you want to do. And add to this, the worlds. The worlds feel unique to explore. Dantooine is a fascinating mixture of violence and peace, with it clearly serving to epitomise the galaxy as a whole, being gripped in conflict and a struggle for everlasting and meaningful peace. Korriban is dark and foreboding, with even the slightest flicker of hope open to the player to either encourage or extinguish. No, please, I cannot. Manan is a world dominated by politics, bureaucracy, and deceit, and water, lots of water. And Tatooine is bleak, filled with sand. So much sand. Oh god, he's gonna say it, isn't he? He's gonna say it. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. Seriously, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. I have the hardest time deventing that film. It's basically Twilight with lightsabers, only the lightsabers aren't enough to save it. And these planets are explorable at your own leisure. You don't have to do one in any particular order. You can do them in any order you like. It won't have any particular knock on your gameplay. Although I would recommend doing Kashyyyk, then Tatooine, then Manan, and then Korriban. Why? Because when you get to Korriban, if you're fully powered up, oh my days, is it fun to just annihilate all those Sith Moth good or bad. It's so much fun blitzing through the lot of them, whereas Kashyyyk is probably the easiest one to tackle first because a lot of the enemies are relatively unpowerful. It's a good mixture of politics and combat. allows you to hone both sets of skills. And this, coupled with the soundtrack, which I mentioned before, is so authentic, so thematic, and so impressive, it's really hard not when you're playing the game to become completely immersed and lose hours upon hours exploring the world and just getting sucked into its characters and lore and the music. It's, oh, I'm gonna go play it right now. Yet even though you are a mere apprentice, your potential is unlimited and your progress amazing. And for those reasons, for me, it's really easy to forgive the game's lack of aesthetic prowess. And more to the point, as I mentioned at the beginning of this review, it's nothing a HD remake wouldn't address in some way because then the lifeless environments, the piss poor textures, and the somewhat repetitive nature of some of its NPCs can be eliminated and we finally have a game on our hands that will rival anything in the next gen market. Are you listening, Disney and LucasArts? Give me what I want. Enough of the goddamn Lego Star Wars and take the remake of that I'm a public No! No! However, try as you might to explore, try as you might to sit and absorb the world for what it is. You cannot escape your destiny. You must face Darth Malak again. Again? What the hell am I talking about? Well... So, 
Yes, this game is about as old as some of my shoes. So the chances are you should have played this game for the story, if not by now. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna spoil the plot for you because it's real, real good. To tell the story as a whole would probably take around 30 to 40 hours, so I'll stick to the main plot points that you can't deviate from even if you're a goodie or a baddie or an in betweeny. And why am I telling you the story as opposed to commenting on its goodness or badness as a whole? Because it's a freaking amazing! So, in a galaxy far, far away, there was this guy called Revan, and he was super awesome and cute. He was the most powerful and adept Jedi, 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 Jedi Padawan the Order had at their disposal, who, despite their best intentions, through the pursuit of power, fell to the dark side of the Force and began a ruthless campaign against the Republic with a fleet that he'd massed, amassed mysteriously as if out of nowhere. However, he perished when the ship that he was marshalling was attacked by a Jedi strike team led by Bastila Shan. And in the process of the attack, Darth Malak saw his master's ship being boarded and decided at that point, as his apprentice, to usurp his master's throne as the dark side of the Force's leader and attacked the bridge. Supposedly killing his former master and seizing power for himself. Or so the galaxy thought. So as the story progresses, you as the Republic soldier, you come across monuments left behind by these mysterious precursor race, later referred to as the, Rakat uh, the Rakatan? Rakatana? Oh god, I don't know. Anyway, point being, they lead to something called the Star Forge, said to be an ancient relic of Sith power from the original Sith species empire that enslaved the, uh, the Rakatan, Ratata, whatever, to build it for them. And in the course of trying to source this architect, uh, sorry, this, uh, this relic, shall we say, of Revan's power, you cross paths once again with Dark Malak, who's been pursuing you throughout the course of the game. And in the middle of this exchange, he accosts you. He admonishes you for the choices you've made. You. You've never met this dude before. Besides, I had to see for myself if it was true. Even now, I can hardly believe my eyes. Tell me, why did the Jedi spare you? Is it vengeance you seek at this reunion? What? <laughs> you mean you don't know? <laughs> All this time, and you still haven't figured it out. <laughs> And it's at this point that the game goes Cambodian on your ass and drops the mother of all pipe bombs. You are Revan! You've been playing as Revan the whole game! that Bastila saved Revan's life, preserving the flicker of life within his body but realising that his mind had become shattered by the attack. However, deeming Revan too dangerous to live even with the fragments of the mind that he had, they decided to reprogram his mind as a Republic soldier and set him against the Sith Empire in an attempt to utilise their former Padawan against Darth Malak, which ultimately leads to this fateful meeting where Bastila is confronted by Karth and indeed Revan as it transpires about the nature of the, the truth of this to which she confirms is the case. Now the outcome of this revelation is completely dependent on your playstyle up until this point. If you are good or evil you can choose to disavow this persona either through uh, loyalty to the Jedi Order or because I am no longer Revan I'm my own man now and I am pursuing power or you can reclaim your mantle as Revan and pursue reclaiming your mantle as the Dark Lord of the Sith. A true Jedi would never bow down to the Sith. If this is your decision, I have no choice but to do battle against you. Kill her. Rend her flesh. Show her the fate of all who dare stand against us. Embrace the power of the dark side. 
Yes. The sacrificial blood will consecrate this ancient temple in the name of the Sith. With the death of the Jedi, the rebirth of Darth Revan will be complete. And the filler between these moments is masterfully done. If you've paid attention throughout the course of the game, it drops out. Even in the scene, there's this brilliant CGI sequence that reveals to you that the game's been feeding you, drip, drip drying information to you throughout the entire game to try and make this revelation seem all the more simple and plain when you think about it. Like I was saying, Bioshock did it just as well when they revealed that Jack was being controlled by Atlas throughout the entirety of the game, would you kindly? This is no different. Bastila has been dropping hints throughout the entirety of the game she knew who you were, and that she wanted to tell you but couldn't. The Council would not normally accept an adult for training, but this is a special case. They say the Force can do terrible things to a mind can wipe away your memories and destroy your very identity. The lure of the dark side is difficult to resist. I fear this quest to find the Star Forge could lead you down an all too familiar path. And through this, the story is one of the game's triumphs. It's a magical blend of intrigue, mystery, action, romance, comedy. It has it all. And the fact that you get to wave around lightsabers and shoot stuff and befriend people and there's romance. Oh, there's romance. You can romance Bastila. I think you can romance Jahani, but I've never played as a girl, so I don't know if you can. And you can play, by the way. I didn't mention at the beginning. You can play as a girl or a guy, and it doesn't matter to the story. You're still Revan either way. But the romantic relationships and the entanglements do change depending on who you go with. Ultimately, though, this story is what kept me playing it throughout. It's what got me to the end, it with a satisfying conclusion either way, good or bad, and it's what made me want to play it again so I could see the entirety of the game from a brand new perspective. I could play the game knowing what I knew and in, enjoying the moments where they're like, eh, you don't know, and I'm like, yeah I do, and I can't wait. Oh. If you haven't played this game's story for that alone, you need to. It's really great, although I know I've ruined it for you now. Trust me, though, you'll probably forget about this halfway through playing the game. It immerses you so well. The Jedi training in particular is worth playing this game for because it's sweet. The Jedi is never alone. Others in the Order will always stand by you. You and Bastila share a special bond. Do not be afraid to turn to her when you need help in your training. Never mind the almighty and elusive power of the Force. This game does something that no other game, Star Wars or otherwise, makes you feel. It makes you feel like a real life Jedi or a real life Sith. And that, for that reason alone, I absolutely adore this game. This game was an utter sensation upon release, an absolute gem of a game, a delight to play. Retrospectively, I'd have to say it's my favourite Star Wars game today, even better than the Star Wars Fighters, even though better than Force Unleashed, even though the Force powers in Force Unleashed are ridiculously amazing. It just, it's the best all-round Star Wars game ever made, still. Despite the pure pleasure of gunning ships and Rebel Assault, running and gunning commandos or Battlefront 2 or even the UNLIMITED POWER of um, the Star Wars Force Unleashed series this game is makes you feel an integral part of the Star Wars universe as an uber fan like me Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Halcyon. It's been a while since I filmed one of these, so I thought I'd kick off with something that's very near and dear to my heart. On this episode, I'm going to be reviewing a game that came out back in 2003 and came out of absolutely nowhere. Bioware 
and LucasArts came up with Knights of the Old Republic and it stunned a lot of people because it relied on something that's been overlooked in recent years. It didn't rely on flashy graphics or even a good game engine for its, uh, for its mass appeal. And didn't even go so far as to mooch off of the license of its previously established stars and lore. Knights of the Old Republic was designed as a game for the hardcore fans to immerse themselves in the world in a more thematic and realistic way than ever before. Focusing less on a certain extent to combat, albeit combat is in this game, and of course less on space battles, again they're in the game and I kind of wish that they weren't, but more importantly, they focused on your story and your progression towards your own mastery of your own destiny. It allowed you to do things like become a paragon of good, stand for truth, justice, and uphold the wise and ancient tenets of the Jedi Code. Or become an agent of evil, succumbing to the dark side, enforcing your will upon its weary and unsuspecting world.